When I was a little kid, I remember my dad used to take me, I have three brothers, a lot of you guys know them, um, my dad used to take us one by one to the grocery store with him as he'd get these like nightly cravings, he'd want to go to the store and he'd, uh, he'd always cook up something big like seafood at like 11 o'clock at night and I remember uh, when I was a little kid, I was probably 10 and my dad took me to the grocery store, it was in Virginia, uh, a grocery store called Farm Fresh and I actually had a picture of Farm Fresh, th this Farm Fresh. Uh, but Anyways, so my dad took me to Publix, or Farm Fresh. He took me to Farm Fresh. And when we got there, it's like 10 o'clock at night. We're grabbing the things. We're, we, we get everything that we need, and we go to checkout. And we are putting the items up on the uh, checkout stand. And the, the cashier is ringing us out and scanning all the items. And uh, there's another person who's bagging the items. And I'm watching him, and he's really intent about what he's doing. And uh, he's kind of just, he's focused on his work, you know. He's not really talking to us at all. He wasn't being rude, but he's just focused on his work. And uh, as I'm watching him bag the items, my dad pulls something out of the cart, and it was like lobster. I remember this night, it was lobster. And it's like going to be like buttered lobster tail or something. But as he pulls this lobster out, I watch this guy's face, and he sees it. And it was like, uh-oh, something, something went wrong. And he begins to look frazzled, and he, he unpacks the, bag, the items in the bags, and he starts to recategorize these things because he didn't account for this lobster that he didn't see. And I'm watching him as he begins to reclassify, and my dad casually says something, just making small talk with him, like, oh, thanks, you know, you're kind of putting things in order. And the guy says, no, 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 it's not just that. And he looks at my dad and he says, I, put, I, I have to classify things first. So I put the fruits together, the vegetables together, the meats, and then of course the cleaning items in a separate place. And I remember my dad's looking at him, he's like, oh wow, cool. And, and I'm thinking, well that seems pretty standard. And he says, but then I pack the bags in a certain way. I put the heavy, larger items at the bottom of the bag. And then I work my way to the smaller, lighter, lighter items at the top of the bag. And then he said, I take it a step further. If you can picture a grocery cart, he said, I put the heaviest bags closer to the handle. And I put the lighter bags out further away so that it's easier to turn. Like, oh man, I wouldn't have thought of that. And then he, he says, and then I place the most fragile items up in that little child's seat so that you can see them and you don't break them. And I thought, man, what a cool thing. And as I'm leaving, I watch my dad. My dad is kind of, um, he's a very emotional guy and he, in, in a good way, but he taught us how to, I, I don't know, he, he taught me a lot. But this is one of the most like, impactful things that he taught me was, um, as we're leaving the grocery store, I can see tears in his eyes uh, from what this guy just showed him. And he said, son, always be like that guy. He said, always be passionate and take pride in your work, no matter how small it might seem to other people. Because he said, that's how you become contagious with what you do, right? Um, so fast forward a little bit. Um, the, right now, the Washington Post just published a study that said only 13% of people are happy to get up and go to work. So I thought this was a really cool talk. My, my dad sits on one side of the fence. He's always been like this dreamer, and he says, son, go for it, go for it. You can do anything you want to do. And my mom sits kind of over here where she says, is that wise to do? She's more like level-headed. She says, is that, is that a smart thing to do? So I, uh, this seemed like a really good talk for me. Uh, and, and it's something I've had personal experience with, is falling in love with something that I didn't necessarily enjoy at first. Uh, but a lot of times I feel like we're living our dream, we're living the job of our dreams, we're doing what we want to do or what we set out to do, but we don't really take the time to step back and say, this is, this is what I wanted, this is what I dreamed of, but I'm too busy focusing on the next thing. And especially as Americans, I feel like it's bred into us. So fast forward, like uh, I'm 19 years old and, and I, in Virginia, I, I turned 19 and I just moved back from Australia. I was living with my brother who was in uh, school out there in Sydney and I moved back and I wanted to, to do something different. I knew I didn't want to go to school. And uh, I, I feel like a lot of people graduate high school and they don't really know what they want to do, but they're kind of forced into these things. I knew, I said, I don't want to go to school. I don't want to go to college. And so I decided to join the Air Force kind of as a whim. And I had this really cool picture in my head. I pictured like all these famous people had been in the military, right? Like Elvis and like Johnny Cash. And I was like, man, this is going to be cool. And I joined the Air Force. and. I, I set out and I was going to be a firefighter because firefighters are buff 
and they're cool. And I was just like, I had all these pictures in my head, but it wasn't really reality, right? And um, so I, I go down to the Air Force recruiter and I say, I want to join the Air Force. And he promises all these great things of you're going to be a firefighter because I want it to be. And uh, a lot of times uh, people don't get to do what they want to do, right? So I, I join and I go to this place called MEPS. It's a military enlistment place where they basically take an inventory of how healthy you are to find out are you suitable for that job or are you suitable for the Air Force altogether. So as I'm leaving uh, Virginia, I'm kind of, um, excuse me, I'm leaving uh, Hampton, Virginia where I grew up and I'm going to this military enlistment place. And I get there in Richmond, Virginia and as I get there, they're, they're inspecting me and they're doing a full total inspection. And they basically find out that I wear contacts. I'm like, I wasn't really hiding it, but they find out that I wear contacts. And apparently, for a firefighter, if you're going into like a burning building, then the, the, the smoke from, from the room can mess up your contacts. So they basically decided you're not gonna be a firefighter. And I'm like, oh, well, man, okay. So they tell me later, I'm going to do what's called air transportation, which basically is a not so glamorous job. It means you do all the jobs of an airport. You're throwing bags onto a plane, you're like sweating in the belly of an airplane, and you're servicing the bathrooms of the plane, like taking that blue juice that, that there is when you flush the toilet, and you're taking that out and then putting fresh blue juice in. It's, it's kind of a gross job at times. But I find out I'm gonna do that, and I'm like, I'm, I'm pretty bummed. And then I find out later, I'm going to New Mexico to do it. And um, New Mexico, the state, not, not a, a different country, not some exotic place, right? <laughs> this was before like Santa Fe is like a food hub. Anyways, I get there and I, I'm going to a place called Clovis and I, I get there and I, I have this decision to make and I was kind of conscious about it because I'm like, I can spend the next six years, the, the, the duration of my enlistment, being miserable in a place I don't want to be, in a job I didn't choose to do, or I can kind of make this conscious decision to try to find the joy in what I'm doing, try to fall in love with what I'm doing. So again, I feel like there's lots of glamorous talks on how to fall in love or, or how to do what you love, how to chase your dreams. And uh, it's way more glamorous to talk about that. I know I've seen these great talks from like Steve Jobs at graduations. And, uh, but it isn't so glamorous to think about how to fall in love with what you already do, right? The things that are already in your hands. So um, I want to point out that difference at the beginning. What I hope to do is to give you guys three really quick, simple, tangible steps that you can take with you from here and be able to apply to your life, your jobs that you're doing, and hopefully fall in love with what you already do. Right? So the first one is to find meaning in your work. And I want to point out the difference between happiness and meaning. A lot of times we talk about happiness. I'm not happy at my job, I'm leaving. Well, a lot of times, um, Happiness is determined by your circumstances, right? So uh, I'm in New Mexico working a job I don't want. I'm not happy. But meaning is looking beyond what the current situation is and saying there's something bigger to it. All right, right now, I roast coffee. And a lot of times people picture that as this really cool, glamorous thing. But really, roasting coffee is taking green coffee, putting them in a drum, and controlling the way that they come out. But they just they turn dark. Right? Like, there's nothing special to that. But I choose to look at it, and people who have talked to me about coffee uh, say, like, man, you're like serious about it. But it's because I'm passionate about it, and I see the meaning in it. I'm not just turning the green coffee dark. I'm taking and I'm changing the lives, hopefully, of the people who drink my coffee, that they'll have an experience that they've never had before, and they'll say, man, this is incredible. I've never tasted coffee like this. And then I'm hopefully changing the lives of these people who I buy coffee from when I am able to say, like, hey, we're going to pay you five times what you got paid last year. We're going to invest into this. And I want you to try to find the meaning in what you're doing. When people go to work, they shouldn't have to leave their hearts at home. A lot of times we're trained to use our hands, we're trained to use our minds, but we're not trained or conditioned to use our hearts. So I want you to think about that. Um, what? The primary difference between happiness, as I just talked about, is uh, it's, a, it's, a, uh, um, it's a temporary thing. Happiness is a temporary feeling. But when you find meaning, happiness becomes a byproduct of that, right? So as I find meaning and as I see what I'm doing, I all of a sudden am happy about it. I feel, I feel proud of my work, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, primary difference between happiness. They've done a study at Stanford of 400 individuals that basically found that their level of happiness was, uh, was contingent on their meaning and their level of commitment to their work. Uh, why is it? Why should I find meaning in my work? Uh, it's pretty simple, and if you're a leader or you're in some kind of position of leadership, you should also know that it's very important that your people find meaning. 
Uh, they, they, uh, I found a couple quotes, and I decided to use a lot of quotes of people that are a lot smarter than me so we can kind of get some good stuff. Uh, Increasing a sense of meaningfulness at work is one of the most potent and most underutilized. Underutilized, like we don't, we don't think about it a lot of times. The best way to uh, increase productivity, engagement, and performance. All right, so think about that. You, if you've ever watched a team or a person who's motivated and understands the deeper meaning behind what they do, they're unstoppable, right? They're, they're, they're like a freight train going down the tracks at 70 miles an hour. There's not a five foot concrete wall that can stop them. But I heard a, a speaker say one time that, that a team that doesn't understand meaning is like a train that hasn't begun any, any movement yet. And you can put a one inch block in front of them and the train won't move because they're, they're problem finders, not problem solvers. And, and meaning will help us stay up late and, and wake up early to do what we need to do to get where we want to go. Meaning is what gives you that fuel to the fire. Meaning is what's going to produce that, that amazing productivity and efficiency, and, and the byproduct is going to be happiness, right? So how do we do this? There's three simple steps that I found through lots of psychology that I've been reading over the last week of how to increase the meaning in your work. One is you need to fix the simple problems you have. If you go in in the morning and you hate going in in the morning, Try to change your schedule. Try to change the simple things that you do that, to, to match your passions, right? Now, a lot of times we don't ever stop to ask why. Why am I doing this? Is there a way I can change this? Try to match those simple things to your passions. Uh, step two is don't focus on what you're doing but why you're doing it. And uh, there's a story that I've heard one time about uh, these bricklayers and these three guys are sitting there and they're, and they're hammering these bricks and this guy walks by and he asks the first guy, first guy he's like, what are you guys doing? And the guy says, I'm shaping these bricks and it's never ending. And uh, the guy's like, wow, he seems a little disgruntled. And he goes to the second guy and he says, what are you guys doing? And as they're all three working on the same job, he says, uh, I'm straightening up these bricks so we can build a straight wall that's going to be true. And the guy says, OK, cool. And he goes to the third guy and he says, what are you guys doing? And the guy says, we're building the most beautiful cathedral the world's ever seen. And a lot of times, I feel like we need to have that, that commitment. We need to have that meaning and that understanding of it because that's the way that we uh, become infectious. I think about this guy who was bagging groceries and that excellence and what he did made me like second guess grocery bagging, right? Like all of a sudden I see and I, I respect this guy for taking pride in just working and, and what he's doing. Um, the third step is you have to be intentional. You don't just stumble into uh, finding the meaning in your job. You have to be intentional about it. Every morning when you wake up, you have to stir yourself up to find that meaning. For me, I remember I used to work at the cafe a lot. Every day I'd be at the cafe working every morning. And I got tired of it and I didn't see the meaning in it. And so what I started doing was I started watching these really kind of cheesy motivational videos that really got me stirred up to see the bigger picture, to step back and see like, I'm trying to build something here. I'm, try I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to grow something and, and I want my contagious attitude and heart for what I do to rub off on other people. And, and I might just be the only happy person that this customer gets to see all day. So. Uh, seeing meaning in it. Step two. So again, three steps. Step two is going to be to take pride in your work. Uh, I found this amazing uh, quote that I want to read. The secret of joy in work is contained in one word, excellence. To know how to do something well is to enjoy it. And I thought that was so cool because how many things are there that you're like, I, uh, I, I think about things in life that I've been good at. Uh, naturally and I tend to enjoy those things and I don't know if I am good at them because I enjoy them or if I enjoy them because I'm good at them but if you think back on your life and things that you've been good at you tend to enjoy right and so I think about uh, me coming into the Air Force and I'm at this place where I have to decide what am I gonna do and I'm not good at what I'm doing because I don't know it and and so I started to take these books home uh, I, I'm in New Mexico and I'm feeling like I, I'm at this pivotal crossroads and I need to figure out what am I going to do because I hate life. And, and I remember just like, I really did, I was not happy. And, uh, and I started taking these books home that are called Career Development Guides. And I started taking these books home and learning how to load airplanes. And I'm like, you know, if I'm going to have to load airplanes, I want to be the best at it. So I'm, I'm reading and I'm reading and I'm reading. And the more I started to read these books, the more I started to realize that there's information in here that other people don't know. And I started to kind of take pride in that, and that kind of gave me this boost of confidence and, and on the job. And then, and then I started noticing outside of the job, I started to walk with a little more, a little more you know, stride in my step because I understood that I, I knew something that somebody else didn't know. Well, I'm, I'm, it comes time, and we're, we're on the job, and we're loading this C-17, which is a big, a big military airplane. And I remember um, 
we had loaded this Hummer onto the floor of the airplane, and this thing, this, the planes is leaving straight from there and going to Baghdad, and um, we're out in New Mexico, and it's hot, and everybody's kind of itching to get off the plane, and I look down, and I see the tie down that's holding this Hummer to the airplane floor. When you, when you tie something to an airplane floor, you have to restrain it, because otherwise, when the plane hits, hits the, the flight line and it breaks, the, the Hummer is going to roll on the flight deck straight through the nose of the airplane, so you have to have all this restraint, and there's certain numbers I'm not going to go over, but it, it's really important that it's tied down properly. Well, I look at this Hummer and I realize that it has nowhere near enough restraint and nobody else sees it. And I kind of say, hey guys, guys, we, what's going on here? And everybody's like, oh yeah, it's good. And, and these are people that outranked me and all this stuff. And, I, and I'm thinking, hey, we got to retie this. And I tell them and uh, they kind of all get off the plane and I fix this problem myself. And later on, it, it, these situations kept, kept happening where I'm the one who knows how to do something that nobody else knows how to do, and I became known as that person. Everybody said, well, ask Jerry, ask Jerry. And that, to me, gave me this sense of excellence. And I, before I knew it, I was falling in love with it, and I was craving this information that was helping me to be better than everybody else in my job. And so that's how I believe that excellence in what you do becomes a love for what you do. Uh, I wrote this little quote, and, uh, and I think it's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I want you guys to listen to this and think about this because this is how I think that hard work can become a love for what you do. All right, so uh, hard work inspires an attitude of excellence, which creates even better work, which then builds confidence, which breaks out as encouragement both to me and to those around me. Uh, when you watch somebody do something well, it encourages you, right? And that person's encouraged by doing a good job at it. Um, think back on the things in life that you've been good at. Uh, you tend to enjoy those things, and I believe this is through conditioning. I believe that we condition ourselves into loving something because we get encouragement, and then like our brains think better and more positively about those situations because we've now been told we're good at them. Uh, so step one, find meaning in your work. Step two is take pride in your work. And step three is encourage others through your work. This is last, but this is not least. This is the most important thing you can do. Uh, I studied psychology in school, and one of my favorite psychologists was a guy named Martin Seligman. Martin Seligman is probably the most important psychologist, in my opinion, that there has ever been and that there will ever be because he turned the tides. He took psychology from studying uh, what's wrong with people and how do we fix it? How do we fix this guy who's bipolar? How do we, how do, and, and that was important, but he said psychology is half-baked. He said we haven't even begun to look at the people who are happy and who have positive lives and what makes them positive, what makes them happy, what makes them love what they do, and how can we breed this with other people. And what he found was three really important steps. <coughs> he said it was three steps, and this is what makes people uh, uh, find meaning in their work and he said uh, and, and in their lives ultimately he said step one is you need to increase simple pleasures he said if you enjoy going to Disney go to Disney if you enjoy taking the kids on a walk do that he said you need to increase simple pleasures step two is um, you need to find uh, a, a meaning in your work is, is ultimately what it was. And he said, uh, he made this uh, analogy of this guy who walked onto the, to the, to the floor at, at uh, uh, trading stocks. And, and he walked on the stock floor and he said, for, for Len, he said, time stands still and he didn't know where he was. And I feel like that a lot of times I'm, I'm cupping coffee and Justine will call me and be like, where have you been? And it's like, I'm, I'm just, that's where I'm in my flow. Time stands still. And he says, the third thing that you have to have is you have to live a life that's not inwardly focused but outwardly focused. You have to do something that encourages somebody else, right? He says that's the most important thing uh, for his theory, which is positive psychology. You should really check him out. Authentic Happiness is one of his websites. Use your signature strengths and virtues in the service of something much larger than you are. And again, that kind of circles back. You can see how these three things are all hinging on the other right to finding meaning in your work once you find that meaning and you discover that your work is larger than yourself and that there is meaning and value to it you can't help but take pride in your work and once I take pride in my work I can't help but encourage others and myself through my work uh, so when we commit our work and skills to helping someone else we begin to find meaning and that's that circular thinking uh, that happens with this uh, taking the focus off yourself will help practice selflessness once you get in the habit of practicing selflessness it becomes a routine which becomes your belief right uh, this altruistic living is is from force of habit what simply put encouragement is to uplift someone else encouraging others through your work is the simplest and most effective way to gain happiness and meaning through your job right 
Encouraging others with your work is the simplest and most effective way. So if you're to change one thing to help you fall in love with your work, it's to help someone else with your work, right? So I have a, um, a little exercise that was my how-to, how to fall in love with your work. And it is when you leave here today, I want you to think about somebody in your past who has either come to you for help or who you have helped or, or who, who has helped you. And you need, and I'm thinking more particularly in your workplace, if it's somebody who maybe they wanted to learn how to write code and you knew, knew how to do that and you maybe kind of brushed it off. I think we all have those situations where we're um, confronted with somebody who wants to know something that we know how to do or they want to learn something or we can just simply help, come alongside and help somebody. I want you to think of that person. I want you to try to reach out to that person and to try to encourage somebody else through your work. I want you to try to help someone else get where they want to go because that's going to help you get where you want to go. All right, so that's my exercise. The recap again, find meaning in your work is to add value to what you do. It's to add heart value to what you do. Take pride in your work. Hone your skills and the pride will come. Encourage others through your work is to take the focus off yourself and to put it on others. These steps will help you enjoy life more and find a deeper, more meaningful love for the work you do. Uh, Will Smith, the great Will Smith, <laughs> said this quote that I absolutely love though. It's so good. If you're not making someone else's life better, you're wasting your time. At the end of the day, it's true. Thank you guys. Some, some time left over, so fire away some good questions at Jerry, right? <laughs> yes, please. Where are your beans from? Uh, we buy beans from all over the world. Um, and one of the things that I kind of hit on earlier, but I, I wanted to start finding meaning in my work, I was buying coffee from just importers, which is pretty simple. And, and most roasters, that's how they do it. They just get on the phone and they call an importer. Uh, and they say, hey, like, what do you have that's good? And they buy it. Um, what we do now is we buy uh, about 85% of our coffees now are direct trade coffees, meaning I've gone to the farm and, and purchased the coffee and agreed on a price with the farmer. Uh, we right now buy from all over. There's four main countries that we work, Kenya, Guatemala, Colombia, and Ethiopia. And that's just, yeah, of course. Yes, sir. Um, I actually moved here when I got out of the Air Force, my wife and I uh, moved here and we thought we were going to start a brewery um, because I had fallen in love with like the science meets cooking approach that there was in beer and beer you have this like wild fermentations and stuff and I didn't really tell that story earlier but um, when I got here I, we, we thought we were going to do that. I had been brewing uh, beer, home brewing and then helped a friend open his brewery back in New Mexico and when he kind of offered me a partnership we said no we're ready to start something new. We came here, that's what we're planning on doing is a brewery here and uh, my brother was doing espresso catering and he asked me to roast coffee for him and I did it and it was really bad but um, and I remember I was just like uh, I was talking to my wife and I was like um, Justine this is like this is simple stuff like roasting coffee sucks there's nothing to it it's just turning beans dark and um, and beer is all this crazy extravagant stuff and she was like well if that's true then like wouldn't more people be doing it well and like so she started buying me these books and I started learning these like chemistry science books of sugars and and then I got hooked on it and, and it's been nonstop since so, yes no. so what's next um, I think that right now I'm focusing on making 100% of our coffees direct trade uh, we're focusing on some more awards not because it uh, helps us uh, feel better about ourselves but it also helps grow the business so um, we are right now in the process of applying for a roaster of the year which is an international award which would be really cool to win um, and so uh, I think just keep getting better and, and to serve customers better, maybe open another retail location. It's been, it's been in, you know, on our radar forever, but uh, we haven't done it just because right now uh, the, most, uh, the best thing we can do for, for the coffees we buy is actually to continue to, to invest our money in growing um, direct relationships. So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Um, so I first started buying coffee two years ago directly and I went to this auction. Somebody had given me a ticket and this ticket was all in Spanish and I didn't speak any Spanish at the time. I still speak very little. But, uh, and I remember looking at it, I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do, but I saw this email and so I went on Google Translate and I did this email and I sent an email to them saying, hey, I just want, I want to come. And they said, yeah, it's cool, it's an auction. Well, you go to this auction and we cup like 100 different coffees and uh, cupping is just where you taste the coffees and you critically analyze, does it have the right balance of flavors and things. Um, there's a full protocol to it. But uh, we found, found this one coffee that we really liked and then come auction time, we decide to buy it. We meet the lady afterwards and it was kind of impersonal because we're just like, we sit down with her and there's a translator and um, that was all that had happened. And um, as we, began to talk to her, I started, I was like, hey, can I have your email? So I started kind of treating her as my pen pal and, um, and sending her emails on like, hey, this is what maybe we should do with the coffee, let's try this. And, um, and now we have a really great relationship like in Brazil and in Colombia and um, where we are, we're, we're emailing them throughout the year, we're helping them kind of fine tune some of those processes. And I think that's the most important thing is for the sustain sustainability of the coffee, of the product, which is their livelihood and, and mine too, is to get better at what we do, right? So taking pride in our work. Um, so that's a lot of it is built and a lot of our relationship is around making better coffee. So, so because coffee is a commodity, does that affect the trading prices at all? Right. Like <clears throat> no. So coffee trading price right now is like $1.14 a pound. And it's so low and it's not sustainable. Even fair trade is like a dollar sixty. And no farmer can live off of a dollar sixty a pound. I mean, unless they're mechanically harvesting their coffee, in which case labor cost goes down. Uh, but market price has no effect on what we do because we're uh, most of the time over quadruple and five times the, the, the uh, price of, of the market. So, yeah, market's not even, it's an afterthought for us. Yes, sir. Why didn't you just come and work at? Uh the airport you're bagging like what made you stop doing what you were excellent at and choose a new yeah I actually I actually applied and got a job at an airport here when I got here and um, I didn't I didn't actually ever even work that job because I got that kind of as a fallback and then um, I was motivated to start my own company to because um, I just hated what I was doing and I, I don't know. I mean, like, so this talk isn't about don't go after your dreams. It's just about sometimes stepping back and realizing that you are, you are doing your dream. But I think I was just motivated because I wanted something fresh and I wanted a challenge. Uh, yes, sir. I, I hope by example, I, but I mean like we, uh, we do team meetings and where most people do team meetings and I feel like the, the boss fusses at everybody about what's not right and how to tighten up and all this stuff. We do team meetings and it's almost exclusively about how to be better, how to make better coffee. We just do experiments and kind of, um, I think that by example of just like, hey, this is so important that our coffee tastes perfect. And, um, if you guys haven't been into our shop, or if you have been, I always recommend try coming by and try a couple different pour overs and just taste how different coffee can be. And um, I think that when you're so passionate about something, it can't help but rub off on others. Yes, sir. Why did you choose the name Lineage? And why is your cold brew so amazing? <laughs> uh, why do we choose the name Lineage and why is our cold brew so amazing? Um, lineage, my granddad owned a fruit stand in St. Augustine, Florida. And he used to always tell me about how good his fruit was. And he was like, man, we, we used to fly all over the world to get these amazing products to sell at my fruit stand. And we took so much pride in these things. And so I think that was where we first started thinking. And I remember Justine and I were laying in bed in the, uh, at night one time. We were just think, you know, thinking, talking about things. And we said, like, line. We want to be, like, linear. We want to be forward thinking. And we were trying to think of something that was very strong and representative of now and, and the things that led us to this point. But we wanted something that was forward thinking. The name Lineage was a very strong name, we thought. But also also, we had come from this lineage of like doing excellent things, but we wanted to be someone that if you drew a, a, a timeline of coffee, that we would be something worth putting on that timeline. And to me, that was kind of what lineage represented. And uh, cold brew, we do uh, one pound of coffee steeped to one gallon of water, and then we steep it for 18 hours. You got to use the right coffee, so you got to buy coffee from us, unfortunately. But, uh, <laughs> and yeah, I th uh, the, the honey. In the milk. <laughs> yes, sir. 
Uh, what, what would you say to um, folks who are in that spot where they're trying to determine, should I leave to go do something I love, or do I have something I could love? Like they're in that spot where they're trying to figure out, is it fight or flight kind of thing? You know, do, like in your yeah. situation, you left to go do coffee versus no, stay and learn how to be excellent at this thing, and, and there is yeah. a way I can change my attitude with what happened. Yeah, I think the best thing you can do is fast forward and see where is that where is that going to end? Uh, Justine makes fun of me because I have this saying from, from the office and from the show, the, the British version. Uh, and he says, it's better to be at the bottom of a ladder you want to climb than halfway up one you don't. A lot of times we kind of get ourselves stuck in this rut because we're like, well, I'm here now. And so I would say if you step back and you look and you say, well, in 10 years, I'm only going to be here. I don't want to do that. Like, hey, I'm going to cap out here and this isn't really what I want. Even if I was doing what I want in this field, it's not what I want, then you need to leave. Yes, sir, Patrick. This kind of plays off O's question a bit, but I feel like having seen you for a year or two now, you know, growing lineage, I feel like one thing you've done really well is like delegate to the people that you have under you and give them a lot of responsibility, at least from the outside leaders that way. So I just want to know what that process was like and was that difficult? And mm. Um, that's a good question. How to find out, uh, like, how to build a team and things. I think that um, if you've ever talked to me, and Marcella's here, she'll, she'll vouch for this. Well, Marcella works with me. But I, we, we always try to have a spirit of, um, like, hey, it's we, not I, and it's not me running things, and you guys are are behind me it's us as a team and unless you uh, have people that are great and are willing to kind of take ownership then you'll never build a strong company uh, i think that every every owner of any company who's doing good things knows the value of the people working with you uh, and the people that are supporting because without uh, the great people that i've been able to surround myself with then the dreams i have and the ideas that i have might not move forward um, so i think that delegation is more about giving ownership to them and saying, hey, look, I had this guy tell me, he was like, I used to run a company of 300 people and I'd have people all day coming to me. And he said, they've got this kind of monkey on their back. And he said, their goal is to get that monkey onto your back, their problems onto your problems, or to become your problems, he said. And whenever they'd come to me, he said, before they'd leave my office, I'd make sure that they were still the one with the problem. And I think that a lot of times, like uh, I walked into the, into the office the other day and we were launching these iced drinks, which we haven't done. Uh, because we always kept it really, really simple. And the goal is that we've loosened up our restrictions of what we serve. Uh, and the idea behind that has intentionally and decidedly been that we would prove what we can do with black coffee first and then gradually show what's, you know, what we can do with the coffees that we're brewing. Um, but anyways, uh, we were launching these ice drinks. And I walk in first thing in the morning and somebody, I won't say who, yells at me and he's like dude we can't launch ice drinks we don't even have a place to put anything in. and he's like fussing me i was like whoa whoa it was like first thing in the morning too it was like super alarming and i just said like hey dude like it's on you figure it out like and now we do it so it's like like we're just gonna keep moving and and i think that is the the value that we've found a way um and i i was talking to somebody and he said you can control the climate but you can't control the culture the culture is a byproduct of finding meaning uh, and that's like pretty valuable to me um, any other questions I got one more. yeah please. how have you found people that are as passionate about this craft as you are how have you kind of brought that team together um I would just say we're really fortunate to live in a city with great people and that um, we've always kind of hired friends of friends and uh, by doing that I mean like honestly we're always very trusting like kind of whoever works with us could kind of steal money from us and they could do these things if they wanted to. Um, we, we, we've just been very fortunate that we've uh, hired friends of friends and there's accountability there and there's teamwork and uh, collaboration I think that by doing uh, by giving them ownership and by trusting them with really all of my livelihood that that they want to pull for it and push for it that much harder back there again yes sir yes th that question was are we able to work with any women's cooperatives yes in africa specifically ethiopia uh, uh, the some of the best mills are run by uh, women's cooperatives just because a lot of the men drink away all of the money so in Ethiopia specifically, uh, we, we work with a lot of women's cooperatives. Yes. 
I, I think that honestly it hasn't become a problem. The question is like how do we overcome obstacles? And I, I made that analogy about the train kind of rolling through the tracks and once everybody gets the meaning, it adds so much value that, that it's almost like those, those problems, we, we all become problem fixers and not finders. And so I would say that we haven't had a problem that's been so large that we can't tackle it together. I don't know if that answers your question, but let me know if it doesn't. No, that's great. That's great. Anything else? Yeah, we got time for one more. One more question. One more question. Yes, sir. Um, when did I? The question, if you guys didn't hear in the back, was when did I uh, kind of have that moment where I was like, man, I love this, I want to do this. Um, I think I went on a run and I was roasting coffee for my brother and I had converted this grill and I had attached uh, an ice cream motor to this like little perforated drum that was inside of this grill. And I remember I went on a run and I came home and I told my wife, I was like, babe, we got to kind of we gotta we gotta piss or get off the pot here we gotta make a decision <laughs> what are we doing like are we gonna do this thing or are we gonna are we gonna just kind of t tiptoe around it and um, she's like I'm in if you're in and so we decided to to spend our all of our money on buying a roaster and we we're like we're just gonna do this and I think you do have to have those moments where it's like alright we're, we're gonna do this and once you step into it you kind of start to realize that uh, when you don't have an, a way out, then the only way is forward, you know? <laughs> uh, have you guys ever heard that, like, scuttle the ship saying? There's a, uh, that when, when they landed in the New World, Columbus said, scuttle the ships, destroy the ships, because we're not going back, only forward. I think that's kind of where you have to get to, right? When you start your own business. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, everyone.